If you drive one of the faster charging EVs on sale in the U.S. today, you've probably ended up at a charging station thinking to yourself, why is that guy in the 350 kilowatt stall? That's the one that I need to charge my EV6 or my Ionic 5 or my Porsche Taycan or my Audi as fast as it possibly can. Can't these people just move out of the way? Can't they use a more appropriate stall for them. Well, turns out it's a little bit tricky because I know I was that guy. We spent a year in an EV6 and it charged really, really quickly. And I always thought to myself, why are these people camping out at the stations that they just don't belong in? Well, we just got our hands on a Blazer EV. We're going to have it for two years and very self-righteously, when I first pulled into its first DC fast charging station, I scooted all the way over to a 150 kilowatt stall. I thought, you know, I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to occupy the station that's appropriate or the charger that's appropriate for my EV. There's a problem though. The Blazer may top out at 150 kilowatts. That charger may top out at 150 kilowatts, but the Blazer can't actually get 150 kilowatts out of almost every 150 kilowatt station in the United States today. Let's talk about what goes on and why you might want to think twice about that dude next to you in that stall and why he might be in it. First, let's just roll the clip here. Here you can see I am at the EA station, clearly 150 kilowatt stall. This is our brand new Blazer EV. The battery state of charge started out at 9%. Right here, it's around 25, 26%. But as you can see, we're pulling in less than one third of what this station says it is designed for. You will see this not just in the Blazer EV with the small battery pack, but every Equinox that's gonna be on sale in the United States, as well as the Honda Prologue, because they all share the 85 kilowatt hour battery pack from General Motors. It's their new Ultium pack design. Now, we have to back up here a little bit because right now in the United States, we have sort of two camps for EVs, the 400 volt EVs and the 800 volt EVs or as some people like to put them, the past and the future, because it does appear that most car manufacturers have said that higher voltage EVs are the way to go. And this is kind of why, although it's worth noting, the vast majority of EVs sold in the United States up to this point are actually 400 volt EVs, because that is everything that Tesla has ever sold except for the Cybertruck. 400 volts is not necessarily a problem as long as it's done right. And as long as you are connected to the appropriate DC fast charger. And that is where things start getting a little bit tricky. But let's get to the definitions here first. A 400 volt EV could theoretically have a voltage as low as around 200 some odd volts. Although I don't know of any EV that's ever been built for the United States market in recent memory that has a voltage that low. Or it could have a charge voltage as high as 500 volts, nominal voltage around 450 volts or so. That would still be considered a 400 volt EV. And that's mainly because when the original agreed upon charging standards were created, most notably CCS, it topped out at 500 volts. It also topped out at a relatively slow 50 kilowatt charge rate and that got bumped up a little bit to 62. And then of course came the modern class of CCS charging standards. They're different charging classes. And that's where we probably ought to go next. The CCS standard that we find most common in new deployments in the United States is either the HPC 150 or the HPC 350 standard. They're very, very similar. They support EVs from 200 volts on up to 920 volts, although there's a bit of negotiation there and most of them will actually support a 1000 volt EV. The big difference is the amount of current that these stations can handle. The HPC 150 stations can theoretically, according to the standard, have a peak of 500 amps, but realistically 350 amps is what most manufacturers are actually producing out there. So they top out at 350 amps and they just hang on there. The HPC 350 stations that reach 350 kilowatts, they get there by hitting 500 amps. And they can do that relatively continuously as long as things don't get hot and they don't have to start getting derated. That's why the HPC 350 stations have things like the liquid cooled handles and the liquid cooled cables and all that sort of jazz going on. Now, the reason these stations handle such a wide variety of voltages is because different car manufacturers have different priorities when designing their vehicles. Some manufacturers choose relatively inexpensive components compared to the higher voltage counterparts. Generally speaking, the lower voltage assemblies and components are just less expensive just because they're more common. There aren't very many things out there that run on ultra high voltage DC in the consumer world. So those components tend to be a bit more expensive. And that's also why we seem to find them in more expensive vehicles. Hyundai and Kia are the exceptions, but 
Here again is where the definitions are important because there's actually no Hyundai or Kia vehicle that's 800 volt, despite their prominent advertising that they're 800 volt native. If we actually take a look at the specifications, the EV6 runs between 522 volts or 697 volts, depending on the battery pack that you get. And the new EV9, it actually has a lower voltage, 552 volts to 632 volts. And that's the big reason that the EV9 actually charges a little bit slower than the EV6. It all has to do with the voltage and the current realities and the fact that it's basically a teeter-totter. Now, what on earth is an electric teeter-totter? Well, this is the best way I can think of to describe the relationship between voltage and current when we're talking about a given power figure. So say, for instance, a hairdryer at 1,200 watts. You can deliver 1,200 watts to that hairdryer by supplying it with 120 volts AC, just like a regular American power plug, and of course, 10 amps. But you could also get there by powering it from a 10 volt source and giving it 120 amps. You're just gonna need really thick conductors in order to power that hairdryer. Doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but this relationship is infinitely variable. As you raise the voltage, you get to lower the current or vice versa. And the same thing basically goes for the theoretical maximum power delivery of an EV charging station, with the exception that they have an upper limit on current. So when you get up to 350 amps in your DC fast charge station, the amount of power you can put out is directly linked to the voltage that you can do at that current. And the voltage in that situation is defined by the vehicle you have plugged into the station. So it's lovely that you could deliver 920 volts at 350 amps, but if the vehicle can't accept it, you're not gonna get that out of the station. And that's where we now have to go back to the Ultium platform. The first crop of Ultium vehicles that we see on the road today and coming in the near future are mainly large vehicles. So full-size SUVs, full-size pickup trucks, relatively big electric SUVs. The smallest battery pack in this bunch is still pretty large, 85 kilowatt hours in capacity, and that's the one that we have in our Blazer EV. But this is the smallest battery pack in the bunch. There's also a 105 kilowatt hour pack, a 170 kilowatt hour pack, and a whopping 210 kilowatt hour pack. Those were designed for the big trucks and the big SUVs. If you wanna go 500 miles in a Silverado EV, that's the battery that you need in order to accomplish that task. The Ultium family was built around modularity, and each of these modules are common in the existing family of Ultium vehicles. They're all based on NMC chemistry batteries, 3.6 to 3.7 volts nominally per cell, and those cells are packaged in relatively large and tall modules. These are all long pouch cells, and each of these modules has a nominal voltage of 28.8 to maybe about 29.6 volts, somewhere in that range, although GM is a little bit cagey on all of the Ultium details. Now, each of these modules is then arranged in the vehicle, and the vehicle can, at the moment, have 10, 12, 20, or 24 modules, depending on the design of the vehicle. The bigger packs are logically in the bigger vehicles, where we have the 24 module units in the Hummer truck and the Silverado EV, and then we have the smaller double stacked battery in the Hummer SUV, and then the single stacked batteries in things like the Lyric, the Honda Prologue, the Acura ZDX, the Equinox Blazer, and also the upcoming Cadillac three row thing, and a bunch of other stuff coming out soon. So lots of different variations here. The problem is that the voltage in these modules is actually relatively low at under 30 volts per module. So a 10 module vehicle like the Blazer EV or the Equinox EV, you end up under 300 volts for the pack. Depending on which number you wanna go with, the battery voltage in my Blazer EV is somewhere between 288 volts or 296 volts. So as far as a modern EV goes, that's actually quite low on the voltage scale. Things get better when we talk about the bigger battery packs. The 12 module pack, it's somewhere around 345 to 355 volts, somewhere around there. And the double stacked pack that we find in the Hummer SUV, sorry, the Hummer truck, and the Silverado EV, that's around 345 volts nominal, but because it can double stack those batteries and put them in series with one another, it can raise the voltage up to 690 volts. That's how it charges so fast at an Electrify America station. It also has the capability of charging pretty darn rapidly at something like a Tesla supercharger station because it can handle higher current as well. 
And this is unfortunately where the sad reality converges at the 150 kilowatt EA station. When we take a look at the nominal voltage of the pack in the blazer, it's you know, around 290 volts or so. Based on the average lithium ion discharge curve, when the battery is at an indicated you know, 1 to 2% state of charge, the battery voltage is maybe going to be around 250 volts, or the charge voltage probably is actually going to be around 250 volts. At the 350 amp current limit on the HPC 150 stations that we see out there right now, you're looking at around 87 to 90 kilowatts, not a particularly speedy charge rate. Plugged into a 350 kilowatt station, we actually hit 155 kilowatts on a regular basis last time we road tripped the Blazer. But on the 150 kilowatt stations, it takes an awful lot longer. How much longer, you might be wondering? Well, in our testing to go from 10% to 80%, it took a whopping 28 minutes longer than it did at a 350 kilowatt station, which is already about 45 minutes. So it really drags out that DC fast charge time by a considerable amount. And that's why these people are there at the 350 kilowatt stations. When we were taking a look at this charge curve at a 150 kilowatt station, our peak was at 101 kilowatts. That was as fast as we could ever charge on the 150 kilowatt station. And that was somewhere around uh, 63 to 65% state of charge. At that point in time, the charge curve was identical to a 350 kilowatt station. So if I was a real nice guy, I could plug into the 350 kilowatt station. Once I hit about 65% battery, I could then move over to a 150 kilowatt station and then complete the charge because at that point, the 350 kilowatt station is not going to be any faster. Although, at that point in time, it's really only about 10 or so more minutes until you've really hit the dragged end of that charge curve and why bother moving? Now you might be thinking to yourself, what other EVs are affected by this particular problem? The answer is, honestly, not too many. Because even though a lot of modern Teslas, especially the ones with the smaller battery packs, the LFP packs, even though they have relatively low voltages for a modern EV, they're considerably higher than the Blazer EV's pack. Also something like the uh, BZ4X from Toyota. It has a nominal voltage of around 355 volts. Not every manufacturer gives complete specifications on pack voltage, but it's safe to say that the Ultium family of vehicles with this 10 module pack, they're actually kind of unique in the United States. And based on their really low pricing, I expect them to be oddly popular as well. Now, current limiting and the issues around current limiting are not unique to this particular battery. This is exactly why we've seen the craze of people putting wet towels on the Tesla handles. If those vehicles could charge at higher voltages and lower current levels, you'd see less resistance, you'd see less heat created, and therefore you wouldn't have the need for those towels on the handles. And that's kind of why we see the direction towards higher voltage charging. Tesla sees this, and that's why we have the V4 stations designed really for the Cybertruck and its higher charging capability. The Cybertruck has a higher nominal voltage because it can do the same thing as the Hummer EV and the Hummer truck and the Silverado, where it can uncouple that pack, connect it in series for higher voltage charging. And then it decouples the pack, puts it back into parallel so that we can operate its motors at the relatively lower voltage that we find natively in the Cybertruck. The reason for the dual voltage pack set up in the Cybertruck is that way it can charge at older supercharging stations without a problem. The other solution to this, of course, is simply raising the voltage. And that's what we find in the Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis EVs, also certain Audi vehicles, and all the Porsche EVs we've seen so far. Because those battery packs don't have a capability to split the pack serial parallel and charge at a lower voltage. Instead, they have to use a separate circuit to buck the voltage up to whatever charge voltage is required. And the Porsche and the Audi, they're more expensive, so they can afford a dedicated onboard voltage converter that can operate up to about 150 kilowatts. Definitely pretty handy there. The uh, Hyundai and the Kia vehicles, they're targeting a much lower price point. So they actually use the rear electric motor and some specialized circuitry on board to act as a voltage booster. And the downside to that is that the Tesla supercharger network just doesn't like that arrangement very much. It's not very compatible with them. So they do have a relatively low charge rate on existing Magic Stock stations. Uh, maybe that will get fixed in the future. We don't know too much about that. Supposedly, you should be able to get about 100 kilowatts out of that conversion. But on most supercharger stations, all the ones that we've been able to verify with, it's actually going to be down there around 50 to 60 kilowatts in reality. So the next time you see one of those slow charging EVs at a fast charging stall, give a thought to the battery voltage. Unless, of course, it's a Kona EV or a Bolt EV, 
In which case, I don't know, point them to this video. Maybe you can let them know that, hey, your vehicle won't charge any faster at this station. But if they could kindly move, ask very politely, maybe they'll be willing to or not. This is no time to shame anybody. But I do think that some more charging etiquette is needed here. And I would actually love to see EA stations give those vehicles a reminder on the screen. They plug it in. Maybe the EA station should be smart enough to say, oh, I noticed you're here at this station. Stall number two is open and this station maybe should be or could be reserved for someone that needs to charge faster. Would you mind moving over? I suspect that a lot of good natured people would if they were reminded of that and that station did actually function. Anyway, let me just think about all that down there. And of course, stay tuned for more Bla Easy Blazer EV content coming up soon. Also, stay tuned because maybe I won't be choking over my tongue in the next video. See you later.